Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. We're, we're going to focus on all uh, 10, 11 of these verses from Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. Paul says this in verse 20, For I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in this body... I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. These are the words of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, my dear Christian friends, sometimes I wonder if interior designers and decorators, if they really have got a pretty difficult job. It's not because they can't figure out, you know, what kind of blinds to order or what type of lamp really matches with the rest of a room. It's not because they don't know what colors go together or what shades or hues would look best. You can go to school and figure all that stuff out. That's a skill, that's something that can be taught. I think probably interior designers have a difficult job because they have to deal with clients who have very strong opinions about what their room or their home should or should not look like. And when an interior designer comes into somebody who's got a strong opinion, whether it's the he or the she, the designer is kind of steering in this way and they get nothing but a fight from the other people who feel as though that only their opinion is the right way to go. Isn't it true that people have strong opinions about what looks well in a room? I think back in the 1970s, they thought that looked good when they had bright fluorescent orange shag carpeting and purple colors on the wall, somebody somewhere thought that that matched. Now most people would probably look back on that and say, what was I thinking? At some point back in history, they thought that this type of furniture is a match. But today we understand that if you paint your house a certain way, you probably aren't gonna shop at Ikea Conversely, if you shop at Ikea, probably the room should look like it's a match so that it's all pulled together. Look, at least we can agree on this. When you talk about interior decorations and design, this is so subjective, is it not? What you think looks right and what I think lo looks right and what we all think looks right, those are all subject to opinion because there isn't a right or a wrong way. It's purely taste. What Paul talks about in our lesson today is far less about subjectivity, namely about whether this lamp fits with this couch. It's much more objective. Whether this Christian life matches what this Christian says. Paul talks about matching your life with your confession. So if you stand up in church and you say, I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit, that that has implications. If you confess that you believe in God, then that means something about how you live your faith and how you practice your life. The reason why Paul talks as stridently as he does in our lesson from Galatians today is because he had a negative example of it in the man Peter. The same Peter you think we're talking about. Yep, that's him. Peter, the one who, you know, the old joke is he only takes one foot out of his mouth to make room for the other. Peter, the one who just last week in this same chapel, we read the lesson where Jesus, Jesus, the Christ, said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of God. You have in mind the concerns of men. The same Peter who argued with Jesus when he was going to wash Peter's feet. And Peter said, you'll never do that. And then Jesus said, well, okay, I'll never do that. Of course, if I don't wash you, Peter, then you have no part with me. Then wash my feet and my hands and my body as well, Peter said. But that was all Peter's confession. That's all what he said. The beautiful confession from Peter, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And yet, while Peter's confession was rock solid about who Jesus Christ was, what we find of Peter's behavior, his actions, his life, in our text today was anything but. You see, Peter traveled, the Bible says here, to a city called Antioch. And when Peter came to Antioch, 
Peter's confession was that Jesus died on the cross for everybody. Jews, Gentiles, everybody in the world. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's own son, purifies all of us from all of our sins. So whether you're native-born Jewish, whether you're from Judah, whether the tribe of Benjamin, wherever, if you're one of those guys, if you're descended from Abraham, Jesus died to save you. But even if you're a Gentile and you have not Abraham as your ancestor, Jesus died for you too. Peter demonstrated that even with his actions. When he came to the church in Antioch, he went and he hung out with all the Gentiles. He ate dinner with them. He dined with them. He affiliated them. He associated with them. And when he did that, what was he communicating by his actions? That Jesus has died to forgive you. And I, Peter, the chief of the church down in Jerusalem, he was a big shot. He was a big wig. He was communicating to all of these people that the Gentiles were people for whom Jesus Christ had died as well. You know how this goes. When the dignitary comes to town, everybody is looking to him for his example. How does he talk? How does he act? How does he behave? You know, this past January, we had Pastor Mark Jeske from Milwaukee, and there was always a great big to-do. How does he talk? How does he act? How does he behave? Well, that's the same when Peter showed up from Jerusalem to Antioch. Everybody's watching him very carefully to break down and digest, how is he going to do this? Well, Peter began by affiliating with all of the Gentiles. But then in the course of time, he kind of withdrew from the Gentiles, and he didn't dine with them anymore. And he didn't talk with them and affiliate and associate with them anymore. And eventually, he just kind of hung out with the Jewish people. Inside the congregation, there were both. Paul tells us why in verse 12. Peter began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Peter stopped affiliating and associating with the Gentiles because he was afraid he was going to get picked on. He was afraid he was going to be persecuted. He was afraid he was going to be the object of scorn and ridicule by Jewish people who said, you need to practice the Old Testament law. You need to be circumcised. You need to stay practicing Jewish customs. This is Peter, the pinnacle, the patriarch in all the church. He was the one who was afraid from all, of, by, from all of those Jews. Well, what happened when he started behaving and acting and practicing in a hypocritical way? He said one thing with his mouth, Jesus has died for everybody, but he was living something different with his life. He was suggesting that if you Gentiles really want to belong to this church, maybe you need to change and you need to become more Jewish. You need to kind of join with this group over here. Paul kind of unfolds what this meant in the text. He said, the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by Peter's hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Here's the problem, right? Everybody was watching Peter. All eyes were on his life. All eyes were on his example. And because he began by associating with the Jews and then drew back and only began to associate... Uh, I said that backwards. Because he began to associate with the Gentiles and then drew back and only associated with the Jews, other Jews started pulling back from the Gentiles. And even Barnabas, a missionary, stopped affiliating with them too. They were suggesting that you're not really saved by grace alone that you have to be Jewish and obey the Old Testament law if you want to be saved. Look, what do you call this? What do you call this when you say one thing and do another? Isn't that the definition of a hypocrite? That's exactly what Peter was doing. And by his hypocrisy, he was leading other people astray. Hypocrisy is something that Christians in the church need to deal with constantly and perpetually because there isn't any one of us who isn't guilty of a hypocrisy a thousand times a day. Look, isn't it true? If we believe in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if we say, if we confess with our mouth, if we confess with our mouth, there is nobody more important in my life than God. God hears my prayers. God answers my prayers. Jesus sits at the right hand of God. He does only things that are looking out for my good. He organizes and orchestrates the church always for my good. But then I go out and worry incessantly. I am calling God a liar. And I am nothing but a raving hypocrite. You say one thing with your mouth, but then you go practice your life as though God doesn't have a clue what he's doing. I'm so scared. I'm so worried. I don't think that God's going to do what he told me he's going to do. I don't trust him. 
and you undermine your Christian witness. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord, if you have a Christian confession, and then you go with talking like a sailor inside your home, if you go into the workplace and you don't give up all of the four-letter words and the vulgarity and the sarcasm and, and the shaving off and all of this other stuff, well, unbelievers do that too. What makes you different from them? You say one thing with your mouth, but you act and behave a completely different way with your life, and you lead people astray. If you say, I believe in God, and He is number one in my life, but then you can't find even so much as an hour to worship or praise Him or support His work worldwide in the mission of the church, well, then you're a hypocrite, and you say one thing, and you do something completely other with your life. You know, isn't the old phrase, do as I say, not as I do? That is the creed of the hypocrite. That is the creed of the hypocrite. I'm telling you the right thing to do. I'm not going to live it. I'm not going to abide by it myself. I'm not going to practice it with my life. But you should. What's the creed of the Christian? Actions speak louder than words. If you're going to confess it with your mouth, then you live it with your life. Your words and your deeds must match. Christians much ma must match the way they live with the way that they confess. So if you believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then your life reflects the same thing. Look, in the case of Peter, it was such a problem inside that Antioch congregation. There was such mass confusion that Peter said, I had to scold him. I had to rebuke him. And I had to do it publicly, Paul says. In fact, the very opening verse of the text says, When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Verse 14, When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I had to say to Peter in front of all of them publicly, you're a Jew, and yet you're living like a Gentile and not like a Jew. Then why are you forcing Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? In our gospel lesson, we heard the same thing. If your brother sins against you, you have to go and show them their fault. If people are giving a wrong impression, if their actions and their confessions don't match, those need to be rebuked and corrected so that their life and their teaching become a match again. In the case of Peter, at least in the case of Peter and Paul, Peter was sensitive to the fact of all these brand new Christians, all of these Gentile Christians who had just come into the congregation, and they believed that they were saved by grace through faith, by grace alone in Jesus Christ, through faith alone in Jesus Christ. But by Peter's behavior, he was suggesting that you have to be Jewish and you have to follow Old Testament customs. It was undermining their faith. Peter was not being his brother's keeper. He was leading his brother astray. In the first lesson from Ezekiel, the same message, the same theme came about. Look, if you have to warn people. You have to tell the truth so that both your life and both of your, both your life and your confession are a match. So that the example that you give to people also means that their life and their behavior can be a match. Parents, we need to lean on one another and help one another with this. Because if you're in any kind of position of influence, if you're a teacher or a pastor, of course these words apply. If you are a parent in a home, of course these words apply. Because every study that's ever been done in the history of humanity has suggested that while pastors and teachers are influential, the children are going to grow up to do exactly what the parents have modeled in the home. Parents, we need to make our life and our confessions match so that we can lead our children, train them in the way that they should go, as the Bible says, so that when they grow old, they don't turn away from it. You know, Paul explains the reason why this is so crucial. He says in these last verses, which we read at the outset, I've been crucified with Jesus Christ, and I no longer live, but Jesus Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. This hypocrisy is a terrible, terrible thing, but Paul gives us a beautiful and a brilliant gospel verse to help us overcome it. 
We believe, we confess that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone. But when Jesus came and lived in our heart by faith so that we can make that confession, the Apostle Paul says it's more than just believing and confessing with our lips that Jesus died on the cross. It means that Jesus came and lived in my heart by faith. That's what faith is. He even says it more boldly. I don't live anymore. The old me, the former me, the worrying me, the idolatrous me, the selfish me, the, the, the me that is a hypocrite. That's not who I am anymore. Jesus Christ lives in my heart by faith. That old me, the worrying, sinful, hypocrisy me, he doesn't live anymore. He was crucified when I came to faith. I no longer live, Paul says, but Christ lives in me. And so as I go about living my life, it's not I who make the decisions. It's Christ living in me. I think with my faith. I act with my faith. I talk with my faith so that my life and my confession match. Because I've come to faith in Jesus Christ, Christ living in me, my faith that is, that's the one who guides and acts all of my thinking, my behavior, my decisions, and my actions so that my witness to the world might be one that Jesus Christ really does make a difference. Look, you guys are all aware of this. What is the number one thing why unbelievers say I don't want to be Christian? Hypocrisy, right? Hypocrisy. Oh, you Christians, you know, you go out and you get drunk on Friday or Saturday, and then you just run off to church and confess your sins and think it's all better. Hypocrisy. What's the thing that unbelievers cite for why they don't come to church? Because I don't see in you, pastor, teacher, parishioners, I don't see that your Christianity makes a difference. You curse and swear, I curse and swear, and, I, and I'm an unbeliever. You worry, and I worry, and I'm an unbeliever. You're selfish, and I'm selfish, and I'm an unbeliever. And the list can go on and on and on. You see how important it is that your life matches your confession? In the same way that Peter's hypocrisy led people astray, and Paul called them on it and said, we've got to get the truth out here. We can also go back to the same scriptures and say, Christ lives in me. That's not who I am anymore, the hypocrite me. Who I am is this man of faith. Who I am is the one who matches the life and the confession. Who I am is not someone who says, do as I say, but not as I do. I say actions speak louder than words. And I'm going to confess Jesus to the day I die, but I'm going to show the world that there is no difference that makes a greater difference in my life than faith in Jesus Christ. And so it's not just my words that become my witness to the world, but my deeds and my life that's lived for Christ matches and attracts people to the beautiful gospel of Christ. Amen.